there were a lot of capabilities that could be added to this chip, such as monitoring temperature, blood pressure, pulse, and even waveforms out of the brain. And, but that was for research down the road. What was amusing about this was that this gentleman never had to worry about money again. And he quietly passed on a lot of this technology to somebody we never knew. And this concerned my contacts in Washington because it never went anywhere with them. Somebody else took it and ran with it, and we never knew who it was. Now, in 1984, I found another technology by just sniffing the web, sniffing the, the, the literature of our industry and a dozen other industries, and I found that there was a professor at the University of New South Wales who, where I still have the files on, that had discovered a way to make a microscopic lithium niobate chip. And by accident, he had scratched it. And he had a um, RF transmitter there. And he had a receiver on by sheer chance. And he found that on a uh, certain frequency, he could send an energy beam to the chip. And it would respond back with a number. He worked on that technology. And that technology eventually I found out about. We flew him in to Denver to our company, System Group of Colorado, and we did a test. He had some primitive small chips he brought with him. They're totally passive and very small, a 32nd of an inch, and only a couple thousand thick. And by etching them, you could again create a unique signature, unique to each one. And this one theoretically could, depending on the size of it and the size of the etching, could have a unique number in the billions and billions. In fact, the uh, test we did was amusing in that we <clears throat> set up a transmitter and a receiver based on removing a air grill from our drop ceiling and plugging up our transceiver into that as our antenna. And we were able to read that thing glued to a little piece of, ply of uh, cardboard from 100 feet away with a piece of grill out of a drop ceiling, which is a, a pretty primitive antenna. Because we didn't know what frequency it was dealing with, so we had to come up with some kind of instant generic antenna. We were so impressed with the capabilities of this. It would read through thin layers of material, like thin plywood. And we were so impressed that, again, I felt that this was a technology that truly had some value. Because we also discovered in some testing that papers, the papers at work he had with him, that if we had a microscopic coil antenna with this, that we could read this from a mile away. And his later on analysis, a few weeks later, he got back to me and said that if we had an antenna, a coil antenna two inches in diameter with a chip in the middle, and that the, what the antenna is actually doing is acting as an amplifier to a great extent and that what sends back out is a harmonic of the original frequency. That his numbers crunching showed that he could read this thing from 120 kilometers in space. And that there were other attributes of this chip that could be tied into it. Well again, I took this in a lot more care this time to a meeting that we had in Virginia at a subcontractor's company that I knew that it does a lot of work for the Intel community. This time I had the director of the of security for all of State Department there, and again, a good friend from CIA. Again, we had, at the last minute, people walk in the door with the right credentials, who we didn't know who they were exactly. It turns out, again, we had people, two this time again, who we, after the meeting, we realized shouldn't have been there. And yet they had credentials that were awesome. Because it turns out afterwards, I found out they had never been called by my two contacts. Yet they knew about our phone calls. They knew of exactly what time, what place, and what we were going to be talking about. And supposedly, my phone calls were made over secure phone lines. What concerned me more about this particular event was that I have in my records again the name at the time of the head of security at State Department. And I got to know him well because I designed the security system, at least a major portion of it, for Main State, or the headquarters in Foggy Bottom in D.C. 
And so he and I knew each other very well. And that one of the things that Bob wanted to do was before he retired, he wanted to have his family, particularly his two boys in high school, experience what it was like to live off out of the country. So he actually gave himself the job. He demoted himself to head of security for East Africa. And he, they, he and his family, shortly after this event, this meeting, moved to Kenya, to Nairobi. And he and I quietly kept in touch through our other contact in Washington. And kept probing who these two men were. Because uh, what bothered me was that the professor all of a sudden got a giant grant. The technology was transferred. He never had to work again the rest of his life. And a friend of mine in San Francisco, who I had quietly told about this technology, because he was involved with other aspects of national security and tracking people, he got a project to do a physical security system. Access control, cameras, intrusion monitoring, everything that works. For a little company in Silicon Valley. And he said it was eerie to him, but what they were making there looked eerily like what I had described to him. He built the security system in this modern fab, building billions of these little chips. He wound up, a year later, being asked if he'd want to buy the security system back. They were shutting the factory down. After they'd made billions and billions of these little chips. And it was a division of a rather major European electronics firm that had the plant. Which one? Siemens. And what concerned me was that they had built these chips, and who knows what happened to them, and they built them in the billions in volume because they're so small that you can take a six-inch wafer and make hundreds of thousands of them on a wafer. And they disappeared somewhere. But in the process, what concerned me more was Bob did not give up trying to find out who these guys were and who they worked for, what their agendas were. He and I had had long talks now by the mid-80s about what was really going on in government, who was controlling what, what concerns he had. Because he had come to the realization there were a lot of things going on that weren't right. And he had supposedly made some contacts to find out more of what was going on. And he had contacted our mutual friend at CIA, another con long-term contractor, been involved since World War II, in the very founding of the CIA, who got in touch with me and said, Bob's got something hot, and when he's back in the country again on business, we're going to get a meeting. A few days later, Bob was on his way to work just after dropping the two boys off at a private high school, I believe, in Nairobi. He was on the way to the embassy, and he was broadsided at a stoplight at 60 miles an hour by a reinforced Land Rover. He was killed instantly. The Brit that supposedly was drunk at 6 in the morning, 7 in the morning, was taken to the hospital and immediately disappears. And all the evidence he had given in the way of documentation was proven to be phony as to who he was, and Bob was killed. And it was a hit. And it's always concerned me today that he had gotten a little too close to who had been involved with this implantable chip technology we'd been trying to for a couple of years then, quietly trying to find out who had been doing it without our government realizing it was going on. Because whoever it is has got total ability to penetrate anytime, anywhere, our government and locate what is going on instantly. Who do you think they are? Research since the early 80s on my own and with some friends indicates that we have at least four power groups in the world. They have wealth beyond all imagination. They have advanced technologies. They have taken over various programs, particularly black programs, within our government and probably even the Russian government and the Chinese. Their politics to them, as we know it, is not the same. And they have agendas totally unlike what our governments, we perceive our government's agendas really are. And that they are able to track unbelievably what's going on around them. At, at, at a minute level. And who these people are, we are, my friends and I have given them names, but they, they have no relevance uh, to what they recall themselves. We just simply call them the Four Horsemen. 
and that these horsemen work together in, at times and they work against each other at times. There's an ongoing battle between them at a low level to who's going to be top dog in the world. The one commonality to all four appears to be an absolute desire for control of everything and everything. And we believe that this is what was causing a lot of strange things to happen in Nevada that we were experiencing and, it, and in a, on a strange way correlates also with what happened with these implantable chip technologies that I personally brought, now I look at it, to the wrong people in the government. Because we never got to use that technologies for what it was we really intended it to be used for. What do you think, these two men who came to the meeting, what credentials did they show to get in? I mean, what, what did they have? Were they FBI or were they... Above and beyond that, they were NSA, NRO, that we would later check and they didn't exist. They did not exist. Yet their credentials were spotless. Even to the point where if it was an access control requirement, the identification systems that they carried m passed all the access control mechanism requirements we had, be it biometric, be it fingerprint, be it eyeball, be it anything, even to access code numbers. They knew it all. They had it all. And it was better quality than actually what the agencies had, which is most enlightening. It means unlimited budgets. Do you think these were, in a sense, uh privatized operations, uh, international corporate or institutional backed entities? If they are, it's at a level way beyond any of the corporate security people I've ever worked with. And I've worked with all the major oil companies. I've worked with all the major computer companies on designing very high-end security systems. The one area that I will say that is strange, and that is the aerospace industry in this country and that I did a lot of work for several of the aerospace companies, either in the way of physical design of systems or in the lease consulting. And it, the storyline basically is that there's a lot of work going on in the aerospace industry that would re indicate that we have black projects that have gone even darker and that there's work being done on electrogravitic, on um, scalar technology, et cetera, that we don't even think that those in Congress or even in the military that approve black budgets are aware of. They've been taken offline. They're funded through some other mechanism. What do you think is being done with these implants? I think they've been distributed. I have indications in the military that uh, a lot of our special forces units have been implanted over the last 10 years, if not longer now and that there are other people that have implanted. The um, uh, group that is, is running a lot of covert projects, what do you see as the agenda? I mean, what agendas are operating? I, believe my, I would believe, Steve, that my initial view on what the, the agendas were behind various black projects back in the 70s and early 80s when I first became really aware of what was going on, above and beyond my own political attitudes on how the really world really turned, 